Hi, I'm Kerry Rye um, at the ATPB meeting in Orlando, and I'm here talking with Kathy Barker, who's our guest. Uh, she's been invited to the meeting. She's talked to our early career investigators. She's also talking to the Women's Leadership Luncheon uh, today. And uh, welcome, Kathy. Thank you. And uh, Kathy is the author of two very popular books, um, and. Uh, at the bench and at the helm. At the helm. <laughs> and uh, so Kathy was originally um, a scientist. She worked at the bench. And just just to start, I wonder if you could tell us what prompted you to move from being a bench scientist to being an author. Um, well, I had I was working. I had a little lab at Rockefeller. I was working on tuberculosis, and I also had three children. And so going to the lab at night was a great relief. I mean, my head could flow a little freely. And also at Rockefeller, we had a tradition of people going to happy hours on Friday. It was a really congenial campus, and people would go and chat about this and that. And everyone kept talking about the same things over and over again. Everybody would talk about, oh, how I, you know, why do they do this? Why does everyone do that? Why, why can't it be like this? And I thought, well, somebody should write this down. Somebody should really write this down. So one of those nights when I was, um, had gone back to the lab, I thought I'd contact Cold Spring Harbor. So I got on and sent a quick email thinking that they would say no, um, but I'd learn about the process and then some year when I had all this great amount of time that would open up, I would then write a book. But they came back to me immediately and I went out and met the director of Cold Spring Harbor um, Press, John Ingalls, and he liked the idea and in two weeks I had a contract. So at, at that point I thought I'd I was really interested in writing. I have a degree in literature also, and I thought um, that would be a great project, and I thought I'd be better at it than, than running a lab, which was interesting and wonderful, but really challenging. It still is challenging <laughs> yes. to this very day. So I, I guess one of the things that give, really gives you a, a bit of an edge over everyone else is that you've, you've seen both sides so you know what the challenges are in terms of developing um, a group how you run a group and I, I just wonder um, in the very beginning of this discussion if you got any tips for new investigators that are starting out with their own funding for the first time they have to build a group what are the key things they need to know about well I mean, that could take a book, yep, of course, I but know. Um, I think one of the first things is, is self-awareness. I think, I think we go through life, and particularly if you've been in graduate school and done a postdoc and you're following what looks like the yellow brick road to success, you, it's very easy not to have self-awareness. But your training is different than the training you're going to need when you're running a lab. So I think you really need to stop and assess where you're going, what kind of lab you want, um, where you're going to get the funding, what your plans are for the future, for your life and for everything. Uh, what your strengths and weaknesses are. I think you need a constant thought process that is really, you're not told about anywhere, I think, in life. I think that's my first, the first thing to do. Yeah. And the real reason that Kathy is here, uh, she's going to be talking um, at the lunch today, about advocacy and how important that is for things to move ahead. And I just wonder if you could give us a little overview of what, you're, what you've got in mind. Well, I know at first I think what hits people is, I mean, I barely have time to do my research. Of course, I don't have time to advocate. But I think, I think, you, I think it comes naturally from your work. I mean, you, you have to advocate about your work. Writing a grant is advocation. And I think you may see an application of your work or something perhaps not directly related that you'd want to push, which puts you in the realm of perhaps activism, where the techniques you need are, are different than the ones you've learned as well. They kind of expand on your communication skills, and they're longer term. So for example, funding. Everyone's very worried about funding now. And say if you wanted to work on funding and get more funding to scientists, there's many, many ways you can go about that. It may be that the thing that you'd like to do is to increase the public's awareness of what science is, how research works, and why funding's important. And then it may be that you think that the thing you like best to do is work with kids and getting into K-12 schools to help students in that way might be the way that you can contribute towards the big picture of trying to get more funding for scientists by increasing um, the public's awareness of it and knowledge about it. And maybe you want to be more direct and work directly on funding and work on policy. So some people, of course, are picking that as a career now. Um, 
going directly into policy with their science training. Some people may want to work with their local Congress people and, and set up an appointment and talk to them about the importance. Many people may want, because it's so hard to try to think about what to do, is to work with their local professional organization. Most professional organizations, the American Heart Association, AAAS, have advocacy sections that can help set you up with speaking to Congress people, arrange the meetings, tell you how to have the meetings, what time of the year to go to the meetings. Um, how important do you think it is to um, have this uh, spread to the wider public so people can pick up the newspaper in the morning and this is what they see. These scientists are actually pushing for more funding, they want more, they want more of a voice. How important is that? I think it's really important but it's completely not without controversy because as many people that think that scientists should get out there and, and talk about their work and extend the, 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 the impact of their work think that once you do that you're not a scientist anymore. And in fact, I think this is a problem that many scientists have. They feel when they get away from the bench and get into advocacy and activism that they're no longer a scientist, that you can only be one or the other, you will lose your objectivity. So, I mean, I think it is important. I, I actually think it's important for scientists to lose um, some of that objectivity. We don't really have it. Objectivity is not really a true thing. And I think owning that we're humans with opinions about our research and where research should go is a really, really good thing. And I think people respond the public responds more to that honesty than to, you know, being the scientist being the purveyor of knowledge and trying to get it perfect. Yeah. So it's one of one of the issues here, of course, is having scientists um, actually form a link with people. So you're not talking in a language that no one understands. You can actually come down to the basic levels. You don't have to talk about the experiments you're doing, but just the basic levels of. The, 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 the main goals you have. So have you got any suggestions? This is something that a lot of scientists find really, really tough. I think they do. I, 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 and people have speculated that sometimes shy people come into science, people that may perhaps don't want to deal as much with people as, as with thoughts. And maybe it does select for that. But um, I, I do think thinking as a human being, I know that sounds very silly, but we're, we're, we're scientists, but we're also human beings. And I, I, I like the idea that science is another human endeavor. We're not, you know, science isn't going to save the world alone. Science needs economists and politicians and writers and artists in order to save the world. And I think first thinking as a human being, it goes a, a, a really long way. And you do have to change your style because, you know, you're a human being, you're speaking, but people don't speak the same language. So being very conscious of what jargon is, um, is, is important in dealing with, um, with lay people and journalists and your next door neighbor and your grandmother and all the people that are actually going to vote for science funding somehow in the end. Yeah. I think remembering the, the um, way we do science, it's very highly scripted, say in a paper, in a presentation, where you, you build up the story, you start with the little things and you build up. People like to hear the bottom line first. Um, you know, they want to know why it's important. You know, so when you're talking to the public, you've got to tell them right away what you're doing in simple language and then tell them the details. Um, another thing that scientists, I think, sometimes get um, have trouble with the public is data doesn't matter. It's not that it doesn't matter. It matters, of course, but when somebody doesn't understand, scientists will tend to pile on more and more data thinking that I'll, you know, I'll get through if I just say one more thing and, and it doesn't necessarily work. So remembering that you're not less a scientist because you simplify, I think, will, will help people. Absolutely. So in terms of the, the category of people that you would really want to make links with, if you want to get your message across that science is important, that if science is going to progress, you're going to be needing a lot of support, you're going to be needing funding, and times are very difficult. What category of person do you think you need to reach out to? All of them. Okay. I, I, I think all of them. I, I think you know some are going to have immediate effects and some are going to have longer, mm -hmm. longer term effects. I think going in, say, and doing K to 12, you, you, you may not see the fruits of your labors for another 20 years when, when those students grow up. But if they're thinking, wow, this stuff is really amazing and, and, and we need to help these people and I'd like to do this, this kind of stuff, you know, you won't see it. But you, you may never see what it is that you're doing. But if you want to have a more immediate effect, I think the thing is to find an issue. You know, to find an issue that interests you when they come up, have your mind open. There's one surgeon in, in, in London who I thought was amazing. Who um, He went to Pakistan and he found that, um, and people from this town that his family had come from, and people showed him the kids making um, scalpels. 
and that kids were cutting themselves up. So he came back and he thought very carefully about what he could do about this. And he very, you know, he knew he was one person, he knew he had a family, he knew he had a job, and he very slowly went about conceiving of an article, writing an op-ed more in the British medical journals, getting response to that, getting it out to a newspaper, finally joining with an organization to come up with a list of fair trade procedures that were publicized in all the labs in England through this organization. So as one person, he actually managed to do something, but it was, it, it was only by being very thoughtful and knowing exactly what he wanted, how much time he had to spend, and what he had to do to get there. So in terms of using social media for doing these kinds of things, what's your view on that? I, you have to learn it. I think you have to learn it. It just connects too many people. And in fact, it's almost like there's a couple science um, cultures going on. There's a whole generation of younger people who are communicating with blogs. Um, Jonathan Eisen's like an evolutionary biologist, has a fantastic blog, and, and he's very political about who you vote for and, and okay. what's going on and off with open access. People are communicating that way. They're sending their papers via LinkedIn. I don't think everybody has to Twitter and everybody doesn't have to do something, but I think if you want to communicate with people, you have to learn some of it. And it's a much more global yes. way to do things now than it was even yes. a decade ago. Yeah. So I, I, I guess there's a lot yeah. to be said for that. I think person to person is still the best. You know, yes. People remember you, people remember yeah. your message in person much mm -hmm. more. But. Yeah. So with a young investigator starting out on their yeah. career, is this a path that you would say they should be involved in at the very beginning or should they just focus on getting further up the ladder and then want. think about it? It's, it's so individual and that's why it so helps to have some self-awareness of where you want to be because if you know someday you'd like to be involved in policy then certainly you could do it as a graduate student. You know, so there are graduate students blogging who do things like that because they know they want to be somewhere at that interface between politics and science, so they go there. For a lot of people, um, they've got to keep their head down and get the research out before they can even think about it. You know, it's, it's, it's very individual. It's nothing you ever have to do. Oh, sure. Um, so it's something you want to do, and um, you have to be alert in your life for different times when you're going to have more ab uh, opportunity to do something other times. In terms of... Um having a life balance, doing science, being an advocate. If you've got any, any suggestions, it's, uh, it's a lot on anyone's plate. I think, I think of it, and I, I showed a slide for this morning, I think of it as nested Russian dolls. You know, and that these aren't odd different things that you're doing. You know, if, the more you think about yourself and you're an integrated person, they're, they're not things that go off and they don't relate. Most of the time, if you're going to do some advocacy, it will relate so much to the work of the things that you want. And so, to save time, because one's so busy, I think knowing about yourself and having this clear view of what you want and, and many parts of the person you want to be, actually save time. <laughs> that sounds like sensible <laughs> advice. Okay, I think we're probably done. Thank you very much oh, for welcome. coming and talking to Thank us. You. And we're Thank really you. looking forward to your talk this afternoon. Thanks. Thank you.